So let's get to the details of Wittgenstein's lecture on ethics. Um, after a, an introductory paragraph where he basically sketches out what he means by ethics, and he certainly means the same thing by ethics as he does by morality. <clears throat> that is, there's no meaningful distinction between them, and I would agree that there is no meaningful distinction between them. He comes out with what is, I would say, the most important part of, uh, of the essay. After giving this little um, sketch, uh, this, this variety of, 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 of ideas of what ethics is, what is valuable, what is important, the meaning of life, what makes life worth living, living in the right way, he makes a very important distinction, which kind of the most important thing I would say about the, the whole essay. He says, now the first thing that strikes one about all these expressions is that each of them is actually used in two very different senses. I will call them the trivial or relative sense on the one hand and the ethical or absolute sense on the other. If, for instance, I say that this is a good chair, this means that the chair serves a certain predetermined purpose. And the word good here has only meaning so far as this purpose has been previously fixed upon. And we sort of have a sort of a consensus about what makes a good chair. So if you say, well, it's a good chair, people know what you mean and it makes sense. Uh, in fact, the word good in the relative sense simply means coming up to a certain predetermined standard. Thus, when we say that this man is a good pianist, we mean that he can play pieces of a certain degree of difficulty with a certain degree of dexterity. And similarly, similarly, if I say that it is important for me not, not to catch cold, I mean that catching a cold produces certain describable disturbances in my life. And if I say, if I say this is the right road, I mean that it's the right road relative to a certain goal. So that's what he uh, means by uh, you know, the relative uh, sense of using words like good and right and, and wrong. Um, you can say that something's a good chair or someone's a good president uh, or something like that because the, the word good here has sense relative to some fixed standard, a relatively fixed standard, I would say agreed upon standard for what make uh, what makes a good chair or make someone a good president. That is, if we have sort of a loosely but agreed upon, loosely based but agreed upon uh, standards for those things and what we say makes sense. Um, but then there's the other sense. As he says, uh, used in this way, these expressions don't present any difficult or deep problems, but this is not how ethics uses them. This is where things, I think, get contentious. Uh, supposing that I could play tennis and one of you saw me playing and said, well, you play pretty badly. And suppose I answered, I know. I'm playing pretty badly, but I don't want to play any better. All the other man could say would be, uh, oh, that's all right. But suppose I told one of you a preposterous lie and he came up to me and said, you're behaving like a beast. And then I were to say, I know I behave badly, but then I don't want to behave any better. Could he then say, ah, that's all, then that's all right? Certainly not. He would say, well, you ought to want to behave better. There's the big important word there, I think, ought. Here you have an absolute judgment of value, whereas the first instance was one of relative uh, judgment. Uh, so again, we can ask ourselves, why is it that Wittgenstein thinks that uh, relative judgments of value, what he calls relative judgments of value, uh, are perfectly sensible and make, make perfect sense and are okay to use, but absolute judgments of value uh, are not, that is, they're nonsensical. Or as I say here, why does he think at the first sense, the judgment of relative value makes sense And the second, the judgment of absolute value does not make sense. Um, well, um, he then explains it. Uh, the essence of the difference, I'm right here. Excuse me, I'm right here. The essence of this difference seems to be obviously this. Every judgment of relative value is a mere statement of facts and can therefore be put in such a form that it loses 
all the appearance of a judgment of value. Instead of saying this is the right way to Grandchester, I could equally well have said this is the right way you have to go if you want to get to Grandchester in the shortest time. This man is a good runner simply means that he runs a certain number of miles in a certain number of minutes, etc. So, um, you know, I'm using an old school reference here, but it shows you that I'm old. Lenny Dykstra was a good baseball player. That's a relative judgment of value. It's using value language in a relative sense. It makes perfect sense because I can translate it, translate this, this value judgment into a simple statement of fact that doesn't create, that doesn't contain any value language. All I mean by that is he can hit field and run the bases, let's say. Oh, then he must be a good player. He's a 300 hitter. He doesn't make many errors and he's a good base runner. Oh yeah, then he's a good baseball player. So, but I, the, the key is that I can translate this value judgment into a simple statement of facts. And the, the key to what Wittgenstein is saying, claiming is that when we use words like good or right or wrong, in an absolute sense, we cannot translate it into a simple statement of fact. Uh, as he says right here, no, sorry. Now, what I wish to contend is that although all judgments of relative value can be shown to be mere statements of facts, no statement of fact can ever be or imply a judgment of absolute value. If I say that um, this is the right thing to do in a moral sense, Wittgenstein is saying I can't simply translate that into a statement of fact. Uh, if I say this is the right way to um, fix a carburetor, then I can translate that into a statement of fact. And so the latter statement is, is sensible, but the former is not. Now, there's all sorts of questions here. And also, you may, if you're following this, you may be reminded of Kant's distinction between hypothetical imperatives and um, categorical imperatives. And it, it's uh, not a bad thing to be thinking about because one way you could read Wittgenstein uh, is uh, as saying that uh, there are no categorical imperatives. 